Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Today is Tuesday, February 4th, 2020. Uh, this is our open study session. We will begin it with our 5G. Evening. Um, I was asked to come down here to uh, readdress this issue. Uh, we had prepared an ordinance based upon the uh, existing uh, FCC rules that have been kind of adopted in the state of Michigan through uh, state legislation as well. Uh, as we pointed out, the ordinance, um, well, first of all, the state and the federal government have taken virtually all control of these with the idea that these are going to be rolled out. Um, the state, in passing their legislation, did carve out certain areas where the uh, local municipality would have some control and some ability to regulate locations and everything. Uh, what we did is we prepared an ordinance that basically uh, called for city regulation to the maximum extent allowed by state law. Uh, it was presented, it did go to the Planning Commission for a formal, for a, uh, a hearing on it. Um, the Planning Commission did make a recommendation to Council, uh, and it was considered by Council, and it's my understanding it's being brought up again tonight. Um, if there's any specific questions, I'll do my best to answer them. I also have Mike Selhaney from our office, who's more of a specialist in this area than I am, but if there's any questions. Okay, Councilman Muscat. Um, I just want to make sure that everybody knows that what you did was to give us some power on where these things go, correct? It, that was the <clears throat> intent of the ordinance. Um, again, this has largely been taken over by the federal FCC and state law um, regarding the rollout. The state and the federal government um, have adopted the policy that these are going to go out. I, I mean, the name of the state law is, is basically, uh, well, it's known as the Small Wireless Communications Facilities Deployment Act. I mean, it is, the, the state policies, this is gonna happen. And again, the state law carved out certain areas uh, where there would be local regulation that would be allowed. Um, you, you really don't have the authority to prohibit them. Um, again, state law and the federal government have said they're going to go in. Uh, by not adopting the ordinance, you uh, forfeit the ability to have that small input in certain circumstances. Uh, does that yeah, I, I think that was what I think was missing the last time <coughs> that you, this ordinance that that was created by uh, the law firm uh, was to give us some something instead of having nothing. And, and I apologize if I didn't make that clear, but um, the ordinance was drafted to allow the city to regulate to the Correct. maximum yes. extent. <clears throat> The alternative is no regulation whatsoever, and it goes in anyway. Okay, Chair. I got Constant. Councilman Constant. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, the the lobby uh, at the state level was huge. Andy Dillon was the Speaker of the House when they called it the AT and T, the cable franchise bill that took away each city's right, and then the uh, at the federal level the growing cable TV industry uh, uh, is it, the, the lobby is huge so this will allow us some control over the new technology that uh, more powerful more be able to send the denser signal 5g technology and and its placement in our city correct correct and the areas that have been carved out by the state <laughs> are, are basically it's, if correct me if I'm wrong but it, it's basically the residential areas and uh, the uh, historical districts correct and maybe Mike can address that more <clears throat> articulately good evening madam chair members of council uh, Mark is correct. Uh, you do retain some <clears throat> regulation control over historical districts, your downtown districts, uh, what you may call them, uh, downtown development district maybe, um, and certainly residential districts. Uh, what we've done is we have taken the power that you have and we've taken it 
to the limit, uh, giving you all the power that we can under the under the law. And um, Councilman, you are correct. The lobby in the telecommunications industry is very strong. I have been immersed in it for 20 years, and uh, the law. Uh, the, the lobby in Washington, D.C. was strong, so the mandate came down probably about uh, five or six years ago. This will happen, and it's a mandate to the states to roll it out, and so the state has mandated it to the local communities to make it happen, and here's what you can control and what you can't control. And this is more of a scientific question, which you may or may not be able to answer, but you may know. It, the, the, so this technology and the exposure to residents near, you know, the humming boxes, do you know how much more um, uh, harmful possibly it is than the, you know, what we have now, than the, the signal sent via the cable? I don't know the, I'm not a scientist, um, even though I'm a Juris doctor, <laughs> so I'm only a lawyer. <laughs> um, but what I can tell you is that all of the equipment that is licensed to be on these poles by the federal government have gone through a vetting process with the FCC and they have looked at all of the, the rads or the radiation or the noise and all of the, um, the things that could be inconvenient or potentially harmful to the residents of the community. Um, all of those have been looked at, that's been regulated by the federal government and all of the equipment meets at, um, or is below those levels. So the federal government has determined that they are safe. Okay, I, I, I remember when this came up and you had come before and talked to us, but then it got uh, voted down by the council because there was the misconception that somehow this was welcoming 5G technology into the city and it's not, correct? <coughs> correct. Okay, Councilman Bazzi? Okay, so obviously, you know, most of us have been doing research about this, this new technology and I'm sure you've been reading a lot about not just cities, states, or, or even countries are actually opposing this technology or even trying to uh, control these companies where these uh, boxes uh, will go. Uh, there's some some countries or some places that are making these companies use high towers away from residents that they're they're not harmful to residents. The radiation, so it's kind of confusing because you, you're saying like two two things. You're saying that you're given okay, the state or the FCC has control; they can do whatever they want over the municipalities, but at the same time, you're saying you're right, this ordinance controls certain things for the residents that the res or the city can say, okay, this is what we're going to do. So, I mean, what, which, which one is it? I mean, what kind of, I guess what I'd like to see is what is the pro and con for having this ordinance uh, for, you know, for the city or the, or the residents? Uh, what's the pros and cons of putting it in or not putting it in? What I can tell you as far as the pro. Um, you are absolutely correct. The order came from Washington, D.C. to the states. The states have then passed the law that uh, Mark referenced, the Small Wireless Communications Deployment Act. And what we now have the ability to do as a city is say, all right, these are being deployed as we stand here, and they are deployed as we stand here this evening. So what can we do as a city? Well, we can regulate uh, where the placement of these facilities are located in the city in residential areas because nobody wants it in front of their home. In historic districts because nobody wants to see a blemish on our historic districts or in our downtown districts. We also have the ability to control the loading on poles or get information on the loading of poles uh, so that they're not <coughs> overburdened and ugly in the in the community which we live in which we are uh, promoting for people to come and move to and businesses to come and do business here now the negative is if you don't adopt an ordinance you lose all control the companies are going to get their license from the state their approvals from the federal government and they're going to start putting in <coughs> their they're called nodes 
on the polls wherever they want. The city won't have any opportunity to review the financial wherewithal of the company putting them in, the licensing that those companies have, the equipment that they're putting in, where they're putting them, whether it's along a state trunk line, a city-owned street, residential district, or historic or business district. And not only that, but for the maintenance of your right-of-way, <coughs> a con would also be you're not going to get the recurring fees. Uh, we have prepared as, as part of the package of documents before you a fee schedule which complies with the state law. And those fees are used for right-of-way management and maintenance. And you would be losing those fees, much like the Metro Act fees uh, that you get uh, about what seven cents per lineal foot or your cable franchise fees, um, where those fees are dedicated to your right-of-way maintenance. Same thing here with these fees. You would lose that share of revenue it won't be substantial, but at least it's something for your ability to go in and maintain and work on your rights of way. So, I'm sorry, the, so the, sec the same question is, okay, so you know, <clears throat> some places or some countries, they obviously they, use, they, they want the technology, but they require these companies to put towers away from uh, residential areas, which serve the same purpose. You can do the same thing or even better but I think they're looking at this as because of cost. It's going to cost them more money to put high towers with repeater towers so they can have that technology. So is the state saying that, or the government, federal, whoever is mandating this, are they saying you can, you can use the towers or you can use the nodes in people's home, uh, backyards? Because, <coughs> I mean, all the residents that I've talked to, they're very concerned about the health risk. So that's one of my questions is why, why can't the state or the city say we can have high towers or you know, antennas with repeater towers that can achieve the same goal as putting these things in people's yards? And just, and I'll let Mike follow up, but just a more global concept is uh, this industry is highly regulated by the federal government. So really the federal government kind of drives the deployment of these things in this country. The federal government has already addressed this and has already adopted regulations that the companies have to comply with. The federal government has also recognized that each state has some input. The state of Michigan, based upon what the FCC did, also considered this. They did some hearings, I believe, on this, and they came up with a series of regulations that are applicable to all the municipalities <coughs> in the state. Um, and I guess what I wanted to address is you need to recognize that as a city, you're, you're basically just part of the state government. You're subject to state regulations in a lot of areas. This is one of them. Now the state, when they're adopting their regulations, recognized that there was important local concerns over this. So rather than just cut you out totally, when the state adopted their regulations, they carved out small areas where local municipalities would still have some control. And what our ordinance does is it adopts those areas where we still have control. So. The decision about how high things can be, how f separate they can be, that kind of thing, that's all done by the FCC and the state. <clears throat> it's just in these small areas that the state allowed local control. That's the extent of your ability to regulate, and this ordinance was designed to maximize that ability. Is there anything else you want to add? The only to other thing would be is your cell tower agreements are generally long-term agreements most likely 30-year agreements. Um, those are still in effect. And while the technology might vary from what's on your tower to what's on the small cells, uh, your long-term <coughs> revenue-generating cell tower leases are still um, enforceable and effective. Okay, thank you. Councilman Abdallah? So it, 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 what's kind of confusing to me about this, and I've heard both sides uh, I've had you know a couple of different people call me, tell me, no, it's not as dangerous as it's made out to be. But I, we have one particular resident that sends out a lot of information to all of us on this. As a matter of fact, he came and spoke at one point. Mm -hmm. um, 
it, in a confusing part to me, this thing is so potentially dangerous, okay? Potentially dangerous, I'm not a scientist. How it passed through the federal government, the state government, and yet no major newspapers, no major, like Channel 2, 4, 7, ABC, CNN, Fox, etc. I mean, I never heard really much about it. So now I'm starting to wonder, I'm just thinking from your perspective, what do you know about the potential, I know that's not your field of expertise, but you said you've dealt with this, mm -hmm. about the potential dangers of this, that's the first question. The second question, well, first of all, it looks like it's being rolled out, because if you watch the Super Bowl or anything else, I'm all you see is 5G, 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 so this thing is, it doesn't look like, I think it's done. It looks like it's pretty much done. It is. The other thing is, and I'm not gonna speak on behalf of the council, uh, but I, for one, would like to see this vote, uh, council chair, maybe come back, to the council to re-vote on this, uh, to at least have whatever little control we can have, which seems like almost like a petty amount. I think it's just, like, here you go, it's just a little tidbit and then get out of here. You know, we're making all the decisions. That's what it seems like. Um, so th that was the second question is, can we re-vote on this or is it too late? We can. Okay. So to, there's a lot there. Um, to go backwards, yes, you can vote on it. That's the shortest answer. They can be okay. revisited and brought back to council for consideration. Beautiful. Yeah, I think that was the whole reason for this study session to see if we want to go back and readdress it. Does everybody? Feel I definitely. Like that? I always have. You, Councilman Constant. Are yes. You and was there a deadline at the yes. end of Councilman, last year? Councilman Wenzel. No. Okay. I mean, procedurally, there, I don't believe there's any deadline for adopting an ordinance, if that was the question. Uh, procedurally, uh, if there was going to be a motion to reconsider, that would have been had to have been done at the last uh, the meeting where it was voted down. It would have had to be done by the next meeting. So you can't do this on reconsideration. Uh, but I, I do believe uh, the Planning Commission has done a hearing on this and made a recommendation. I think you can... Uh, set it for another first read. Okay. Um, I don't think you can pick it up uh, and, and try to re-vote on the, on the uh, actual adoption at your next meeting. Okay. But I think you could adapt the Planning Commission's hearing that's already been conducted um, and just set it for a first <coughs> read and then set can it for a Can you help us do that and get it to the clerk's office? Sure. I, I actually brought copies of the ordinance okay. if you want so, to review that. So the towers have already started to go up. I mean, you can see them at Inkster and Cherry <coughs> Hill right behind the bowling alley. It's a pretty big tower, you know, for that. So can you address what you know, at least, in, uh, in terms of the potential danger? Okay. What I can <coughs> tell you is 5G is not a big tower. The 5G node is kind of looks like a morel mushroom, and it's going to be on top of uh, the DTE poles that line the street. Um, I think the actual node is maybe three or two and a half feet tall. I think I've started to see those on Ford Road and Silvery Lane, I believe I've seen yes. it. Yes, and um, that's where they're rolling out this technology to get away from your larger lattice towers or you know if you find a water tower and it's littered with antenna uh, so it'll be those smaller nodes it won't be a, uh, a large tower and then as far as your question about the uh, the research on the the potential various opinions on the health issues what I can say is I think it's a lot like when when you're looking for a lawyer in a in a lawsuit you'll find your experts on this side of the case for the plaintiff you'll find your experts on this side for the defendant they will each roll out their arguments vigorously what I can say is those arguments have been dealt with vigorously in Washington DC when they mandated the states to uh, roll out this deployment um, In other words. and you'll, you'll always find information that's out there and one of the other significant things that I wanted to address with you as a council as a whole is there is in fact a ruling from the FCC that says your denial of a permit whether it's for cell tower or 5G cannot be based upon those claims uh, because those issues have had 
their day and they've been argued and vetted completely in front of the FCC. So that would be an unreasonable denial which would subject um, any municipality that denies on the basis of those health concerns because they have already been resolved. Uh, that would open <coughs> up that municipality to liability. Okay, thank, thank you, you very sir. much, Councilman Lenzo. Yeah, you give me a couple minutes because I got a little bit to say here. <clears throat> now, uh, 5G, uh, I've done a lot of research and I talked to a lot of people on this and 5G is a very powerful radiation. Okay, that's it, that's a, actually it's, a, it's radiation, and it's it's it, the plus is it can go into places that 4G can it can go in deep basements, of tall buildings. It can uh, go out far out in the country. It can go right through the lungs of a senior citizen. Go right into a fetus of a pregnant woman. And there's been less than five years of research done on this. Less than five. They, they, don't, they won't say how many. Might have only been two years. But it's less than five years of research has been done on these towers. I, I contacted Verizon. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, um, Comcast, Xfinity. Their workers are not going through special training right now where uh, Xfinity demands that these antennas be turned off before any of their workers will go up that tower to work on them. And they, they wear a special suit like a radi uh, x-ray technician does that monitors the amount of radiation they receive. And um, um, now as far as these fees go, probably 99.9% .9 of these towers are going to go on DTE poles. So the city won't get any money for that. And so the fees are very minimal. Um, now, the, uh, as far as how much control we have, they're, they're not saying it, because they, they, I think they don't want to say it, and maybe they can't, but we have almost zero control where these go, except in a historical district, like they said, or some other small ones. They're, go, they're in, in your backyard, you have no control. We, do we? we have no control about anybody's backyards. Well, I, I would defer, or I'm sorry, differ in your opinion there. Um, first of all, you're correct that the pr usual placement will be on DTE poles. They have a separate pole attachment agreement with DTE, but yet there are, is a per pole agreement, I'm sorry, fee that the city will receive. I agree with you. It's not going to be a very large amount of money, but there will be some money that will go into your right away maintenance fee uh, fund. Secondly, <coughs> um, uh, to your other point about local control, you are correct. The state took away a lot of the local control, but did allow us to maintain some control. And we're working on behalf of the city. We're not uh, attorneys for the provider. Uh, so we're trying to secure as much power and, and authority that you have that the state didn't take away. Uh, and so what we can say is, yes, if, it's, if the poll is, the plans are gonna be presented to the city showing every pole location and what f equipment is going to go on the pole and at that point the city engineer can look at it and call in uh, the engineer from the provider and say now this pole here is in a residential district it's in you know this residence backyard they have expressed an interest to not have it there where else can we find a location that is not so obtrusive for that resident and so it, op it opens up a dialogue and I can tell with my work in Lansing against the providers the consensus has always been with the Michigan Public Service Commission work together don't work against each other so if you open up that dialogue engineer to engineer they will find a solution and generally 90 percent of the time in my experience of 20 <coughs> years uh, doing telecommunications that's been the case but th there is some control in those areas and this ordinance seizes upon that ability to take control. If you don't have the ordinance, we have no enforcement ability when our resident calls and says, I don't want this facility in my uh, front yard, side yard, or backyard. Well, everybody's gonna call. Everyone's got one in their backyard and call and say they don't want it there. Because I, I, I witnessed my neighbor directly across the street from me five different times that I seen a truck come out there 
And first they had a map and they located a pole. They took several pictures of the pole, took elevations of the pole, sent up a drone and t took a, a, a area, checked out all the trees in the area, how high the trees are, because that's the main factor, is they want a pole that has the fewest amount of trees around them. And he, I, I asked the guy, I said, what's the chances of that? He says, he goes, that, there's gonna be an antenna on that pole. I says, well, for sure. He says, there, there's no doubt in my mind. He says, that's the pole they want. That's the pole they're gonna get. And that's straight from the, the contractor installing these. Usually so, the contractor is getting his orders from the engineer back in the office. And if we can get that engineer from the provider talking to our engineer, we can address those concerns through this ordinance. Without the ordinance, you won't have that, that ability to have that discussion. I understand. But I'm just straight speaking up for the people here who have no power. And what, what can we do as a representative? What can we do as a representative of the people to give them more authority? Can we do anything? You can adopt this ordinance, which will give the city the ability to regulate however we can and reviewing the plans that come in before they even install that node in that person's backyard. Because Lansing has said this deployment is going to happen. And as you're seeing, <clears throat> these nodes are being installed. Okay, I have one you. question for I guess um, one other thing I would add to that is if you want to give people advice on what they could do, write Lansing and write Washington mm -hmm. because they're the ones that have made this decision. Uh, they have taken most of the ability to regulate away from the city governments, away from local municipalities, not just the city, but all local municipalities in Michigan. And so really what it would take would be a change in state law and perhaps a change in FCC regulations. But at the moment, the FCC and the state have made the determinations and they feel this is the best way to proceed. So. Mark, did, that, have our, did our representatives, do we have representatives that voted on this or was it just something went through the governor or something it, like it, that? It was, it was a state act. It was voted on by the legislature. So we can find out who voted on it. Sure. I have one question for Larry. Have we been uh, reviewing these engineering things? We do have plans on it. Uh, and when we met with Verizon, they stated that none of the poles would be going in any, any yard. And that's what control we will have. They have a pole close to a backyard. If we request it to be moved down the street, they said they're willing to work with us. Mm -hmm. uh, as when we met with them, all the uh, tenors are going on the street side and all within 20, probably 25 to 20 feet in the residential area. And they had a residential house. They, none of them, they, they, they say it all went to the front to the utility poles, mm -hmm. the, the light poles. If I could just add, I had contacted, you remember, uh, Council Chair, I had contacted you to tell you that I thought we should have some study sessions last year about this because we knew it was coming. I was, I was in the building department at that time and I was one of the largest, um, uh, I did not want this to happen. I had heard all Holy the stories me. too. And then when I, once I realized that we didn't have a lot of choice, but we did have some control through this ordinance, that's when I reached out to you and said, we're going to work on putting the ordinance together. One thing I will tell you is that prior to uh, that ordinance not passing, Verizon was coming in and presenting uh, plans to Larry and his staff on a regular basis. We'd set up a schedule of how we were recording those. And they were really receptive to, if Larry made a suggestion, like, you know, I'd rather, can you, can you find another spot, maybe a couple, you know, uh, yards down or something of that nature? And they did. And what made it, what, what that process did was it gave Larry control too. Larry got to uh, make the final approval, so to speak. Once it didn't pass, as the attorney had mentioned, now they just go to the state and they're putting them up everywhere. And we, we don't even, you know, we have to be made aware of it, but we have no control over it, so. Okay, thank you. And, and I would just add that, uh, you know, <clears throat> these companies that are installing these, they're customer service. Uh, yeah. they're, they're not going to, um, be, I, I think they're willing to work with local, local municipalities. This ordinance just gives them the vehicle to do that. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I think we've all pretty much, except for Tom, agreed that we need to readdress this again. All right, thank you very much. Next for our study session. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yes, yes please. <clears throat> okay, yeah. Thanks, Mark. Yep.
Is there any public comment on this at this time? Okay, let's move on to the next. We have our treasurer vacancy. Um, our treasurer, John, is going to be leaving us in April, and we need to decide on how we're going to go about replacing him, how we're going to advertise or how we're going to do this. So, um, Treasurer Riley, if you could come up and tell us basically what your recommendations, what you do in your, you know, what oh. your job is. And I know you emailed it to me, but you know what I'm asking for. I'm sorry, I'm a lost for words. That'd be perfect. Because I meant to bring it and I, it's sitting okay. on the table. Yep. Good evening, Council and residents. Um, so uh, some of the responsibilities of the city treasurer collect property taxes and distribute the funds to the various um, agencies, which would be the school districts, the county, the state. Um, the tax collection is about $70 million annually. Receive all monies from other uh, for other bills belonging to the city, water bills, animal license, building department, etc. Monitor the cash flow of the city. Um, invest the available funds according to the Public Act 20. And uh, we have a, also have our own investment policy of the city. Um, issue and manage the local debt, so that would be the bonding. We're getting, uh, talking about bonding for some uh, water and sewer projects and um, installment purchase agreements that we use to uh, purchase the street sweepers and things like that. You uh, manage that, make sure those debt gets paid, very, very important. Administrate the two cities' pension systems uh, with planned participants of about 695 uh, individuals and uh, the co combined assets of the retirement systems of $220 million. You're automatically a trustee on the Police and Fire Pension Board, Act 345 Pension Board. That's part of the Act 345 that the city treasurer will uh, serve in that capacity. Sign all outgoing checks and deliver the bank deposits to the banks with a police escort daily and be available to answer questions for the public when they come in and for other departments or even the city council when you call. I try to be available to sit down and work with um, people. And then manage the office staff, which is uh, five full-timers and uh, one part-timer. Uh, if you also look in the city charter under section 5.6, there's a list of the duties of the city treasurer that are listed there. But some of these items are not specifically listed in that way. Uh, no, Councilman Muscat, do you have to have to be personally bonded? I, I saw something where you said no, but you're bonded through. Well, if you right, if you if you look in the charter, um, it does say that the individual is bonded or should be bondable. I I, I don't know. It may be more of a legal question. Um, you should. Uh, he shall file a bond in such amount as, as such securities as shall satisfy the council. Okay, well, the, since I've been here, I've only been bonded once. It uh, hasn't been through the city, but through the county because we were collecting the county's tax revenues and the county treasurer was bonding the local treasurers over their money that we were collecting. This, uh, As the city treasurer, I am um, covered under the city's policy with Michigan Municipal Risk Management Authority and, um, and but, you're Mike, bond, but you're bondable is the key thing. I, well I am bondable yes yeah. and um, and then Mike Maldigan is our um, representative of Michigan, Michigan Municipal Risk Management Authority. I, I supplied the chair with Mike's number. I'm sure you, she knows how to reach him. Um, I did speak with him and you know he thought it would be um, um, you know, uh, irresponsible for the council to hire somebody that isn't bondable or, or, you know, but, you know, again, that would should be a discussion that uh, I, I suggested that the council chair have with um, Mike. I would do that. Chair. Councilman Costner. <clears throat> yeah, we know in Redford, uh, Lily Cavanaugh had an issue because she had a bankruptcy and then the Wayne County was able to help her get the bond. Um, and I don't, I'm, I, I'm familiar vaguely with it, but I don't really know any of the details. But just like I serve, I get a bond if I'm a conservator in a probate estate or a personal representative, and that's based on my credit. 
but the bond uh, about how much and what amount does the city treasurer need to be bonded for um i I, w I wouldn't know. I mean, you know, the funds that are available, I mean, I told you we're collecting over 70 million in in tax revenues annually. That's just, the, you know, that doesn't count water bill payments, which is, you know, probably, you know, millions of dollars. I, sh I probably should have researched that before I came in here, but. So, so in other words, yeah, the, the, the treasurer would have to be bonded f uh, upwards of $70 million. Yeah. There's a lot that you can do with your signature, correct? Yes, but I mean, we so we've have in, in in place internal controls and a lot of things that um, you know um, uh, two individuals would need to um, you know move money and have callbacks to individuals separate from the individual initiating and things like that. But um, I, you know uh, the amount of somebody's bonding again, it sounds like according to the charter, it's, it, it would be something that the council would place. You know, um, you know if you read that uh, charter section, it sounds like that you know you guys would make that determination and not necessarily me. Like Dearborn, for example, has a comptroller but no treasurer. They don't. Uh, mm -hmm. Some cities have no treasurer, like Garden City has a hired treasurer clerk. So the larger cities, it's, it's considered an extra safeguard to have an elected treasurer, correct? Yes. Okay. Separation of duties, I guess. Okay. Councilman Abella? So, uh, Treasurer, a couple things that I want to talk to you about, um, and I know it's still not clear, we received an email from um, the counselor to our attorney, city attorney, in regards to when the next person would take over until, whether it's going to be until the next general election or whether it's going to be until <laughs> 2021, and his opinion was it'd be until November. So, with that being the case, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot, and if you feel I'm putting you on the spot, then just say, I don't want to answer it. But is there any, let's start with that first question. Is there any way possible to make things simpler here that you could continue through at least this coming November? <laughs> and, and, you know, so I haven't considered that. I think the council body should talk about that but you know I mean I I have some commitments not 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 work commitments I would be more than willing to work with an individual I but I don't that know on a full-time basis that um, you know that was my plan um, I don't know if that's anything if there's a way to work around that where the appointment would stay until next year and I think that's you know some discussion that you need to have with your corporation counsel okay you and know. the second thing I when I sat and discussed this with you um, my, at least I'm going to tell you my personal preference. My per personal preference, whoever we personally appoint as a council, they only runs through this coming November, and then we allow the residents to elect somebody. Mm -hmm. And and I know one of your concerns about that was in terms of retirement, because you had to be on here until April the 30th. But yeah, in order to go on the next general elections, it'd have to be before, and our clerk is not here, I think he said April 9th or? Tw April 21st, I think. If you read, if so you read nine that. So a nine-day nine difference. Right. Okay. So question to you, and I don't know the logistics of how this could be worked out, but I was thinking if we could subcontract you and use you as an outside source to still do our treasury work where we could still do it to where the residents will elect the next treasurer this coming November. And again, the logistics would have to be worked out. You stay for an extra week, we pay you for just a week or, or vice versa. Again, work out the logistics. But my concern is I don't want this thing to be an appointment by us as a council to pick somebody that maybe is maybe not as good as, as maybe they should be, but to be able to run this thing for a whole year, that's where my real concern would be. So if either you could stay longer, or we could subcontract you for a week, or you could extend one thing or subtract one thing to make this thing work, that would be great. I'm just making a statement here. And I'm not putting you on the spot to, to make a decision now. He's got his mind set on I know, I'd, I'd love for you if you could do it, it'd be great. But the second thing I want to talk to you about is I, I was, I received some paperwork from you at the time, and you mentioned the qualifications. This is for a deputy treasurer. It says they need a bachelor's agreement. Oh, no. mm -hmm. Back to my work mind. Agreement. Uh, a bachelor's degree in accounting, finance, business, or public administration with emphasis on accounting and a minimum of two years government experience or 10 years of recent municipal treasurer's office experience. And that's for the deputy treasurer. Mm -hmm. So for this, I can tell you for myself, that's what I would preferably be looking for with the next person. With that being the case, 
What would you feel would be the best way to try to find somebody? I mean, wh- wh- where are the resources? Because treasurers that we are appointing aren't exactly running around the streets all day. So, I, I mean, I think there are probably individuals in the community that um, have qualifications that this council might feel comfortable with, but unless you kind of advertise and go out to the community to find out who might be interested um, and have them come forward, I mean, it would just be speculation. I have spoken with a few people that I think are qualified individuals for this position. you know, I, I agree that I think they should probably have a degree and if not have a significant amount of Treasury Office experience. Um, I, 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 you know, Lynn sitting here, you know, she's worked in my office for 10 years. I think, she, you know, I think she could, how many, 11 years. Um, so that, you know, like, so she ha- she knows what kind of goes on in a municipal treasurer's office. But there are individuals in our community that worked have worked at Wayne County in the treasurer's office. And so who know, you know, about tax law, they live in our community. Would they apply or would they come forward? No, I don't think we would know who would come forward until we kind of put it out in the public for interested parties to come forward and you know submit their qualifications to the council and this body you know review them and that would be on the administration okay. obviously council yeah. chair yeah. i think left? that's what the purpose of this whole meeting was is to decide how we are going to go out what process we're going to go with to find the replacement Sh- shouldn't council so, chair should council we have, have, must uh, have Maybe I, I don't know if it's in a realm of uh, of her job description, but HR director put out stuff like that too. So that's why I'm here tonight to find out what direction. <clears throat> when um, we had this similar situation happen with the clerk's office years ago, and Judy Dzinski retired earlier before her term. Um, the city council asked for letters of interest, I believe, mm-hmm. and those were actually sent to the clerk's office. Um, I think that's accurate, right, John? There's not a lot of us that were here yeah. at that time. Um, and you would tell them what, or you tell me, we can advertise on the website um, some sort of public notice if you wanted the paper. Um, we could put something together. You know, what do you want? Do you want the city application? It's not required, obviously, in an appointment. Um, do you want a resume, a cover letter? That's what I would recommend. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I, mean yes. I think you're the professional on this that would tell us what you would be. I'd be happy to help, yeah. Yeah, you, I think yeah, that so would be, yes. you know, th- that's what I would like to see Absolutely. happen. I'm not Absolutely. saying it's going to happen. So we happen. could wrap. So I could draft something, if you will, send it to you, have input, and then let's, you know, you, you tell me this is the date we want to go with it. I think as soon as possible. Yeah, myself. we need to start this right sure. away because we are getting to. And so, what do you? Really. How long do you want? Three weeks? Two weeks? Um, thirty days to to meet again. You thirty mean? weeks. I mean, thirty Three. days. <laughs> thirty days. Oh, notice. Yeah. As to when the letters of interest, et cetera, would be due, and then um, you know, I'd <clears> funnel it through you and. Okay. We go from there. Yeah. And, and then we and can sure. interview them. Um, yeah, so that's what I remember too that there was a public study session where they can interview them publicly with all of us Correct. there. Yeah. That way it gives him a chance to, you know, sure. let the new person feel around the office a little bit. <clears throat> and I'll be available to answer questions for them or um, and like I said a couple of people have approached me and I've sitting down with them and just talked about, you know, some of these things that I do and, you know, things like that. Um, and I know um, the council, uh, the secretary has done the research of when the prior clerk was, so she has some of that background on the process that the council. I have, there was an ad that okay, was put in the paper three times. Okay. Okay, and it does, um, it, according to the provisions of the city charter, section 4.5. Now this was for the city clerk. Mm-hmm. Well, same um, section, yeah. yes. Yeah. Filling of vacancies in elective office. It tells you when a vacancy occurs in any elective office, the vacancy shall be fid- by, filled by a appointment. We already know that. Um, and then in this one, it did say the next general election will be held on so and so. In order to be considered for the vacancy, you must have a two year resident and registered voter. Um, I think that's an urge. Yes. Or I have yes. some back on that. And I'll get a copy too. of that from you. Yes. Okay. And it just goes on, all materials must be submitted, will be treated with confidentiality. There will be a, you'll have a five-minute presentation. Now, this is all up to you 
it, that sounds good to me. Council so do you want to, was, was there a date given together. on that? Well, there was about when it was. The charter yeah, says. so that's the other thing that we'd set the 30 day and then you tell me what would work best in terms of the date. A vote will be taken. The letter of interest and resume must be received in the office of the city clerk no later than, and then it was published three times in the paper. Okay, <clears throat> perfect. Councilman Abdella? So, something else that we'd have to address, Director, is obviously, and I, I don't know how the charter works in terms of this specifically, but in terms of pay, I mean, are they paid the same thing as to it is. an elected so it's official? It is, set by the commission. Just prorated? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, yeah, whatever the annual salary is. It'd be and then, the same Yeah, thing. and they okay. get paid in the same manner with the rest of us. Okay, thank Councilman you. Councilman Wenzel? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sure, or maybe I'm not sure, but I'm sure um, um, John Riley will give us what he thinks the criteria this person should have. Would you be willing to do that, you know, privately or something, say this is what I think this candidate should have to qualify for this position? Well, I mean, yeah, I think, I mean, you know, I know what the experience. credentials are, you know, I think, you know, we've just kind of went through that, you know, a degree Fine, yeah. and some experience in municipal treasury or, and, and um, you know, things like that and then um, can we use John to help us make a decision on this or is well, it it's the council's decision I mean obviously uh, but well, we can bounce sure it off yeah. well yeah I, I think it would be good if you weighed in on it yeah. if you want yeah. yeah and also um, I had a question for a comment but uh, it, it's you know, said it has to be bondable I mean is, does that just mean bondable or do they eventually have to be bonded well, like I said, I I have only been bonded once here, and it wasn't by the city; it was through the county. But you know, the charter says, you know, that the person should file a bond if the council what uh, security bond satisfactory to the council. So it sounded like you know, in a way that the council could say, you know, you need to have this here, and the person would have to, you know. But even those are kind of legal questions, kind of outside the, my realm. I'm just telling you the experience that I've had. Okay, okay you know, thank just you. Just one sure. thing I'd like to add is um, that John Riley has served uh, the city for over 20 years without probably any complaints at all, except yeah, maybe tax all too high complaints. or something. <laughs> but he's done the city proud, and we're proud to have you ha here all thank this you. time, and uh, good luck in the future. I appreciate thank that. You. Yep, thank you. Constant. And I know there was a case with the city of Dearborn when someone applied for a position. They did a criminal background check, and then the person they did have a criminal record, and the person sued. So I think it's important we have to decide how much of a background check we want to have regarding. I think we need one. I mean, I guess I might defer a little bit to our HR and, and director, but I think credit check and then whoever applies they're going to have to consent in writing to let us do that because this case involving the mm -hmm. city of Dearborn mm -hmm. the person had signed something saying they agree to a criminal background check and you, you know anybody that works in the treasurer's office we do as much background check as we can very obviously and so I'll defer to the HR director because I have to lean on her to you know make sure that gets done and their office handles that for our police and fire and for our general employees and so I think that would make a, a lot of sense to have a background sense yeah uh, so yeah. we we have had background checks and I've been one of the people that pushed it when I first got here even of part-time employees I will say for the appointment of city clerk there were no background checks done at that time um, you know barring that it's not illegal I don't see why it wouldn't for this particular That's situation him, him yeah you obviously can't do it if you're an elected position um, but yeah we have a yeah, that they we have a packet. to it when they apply right it, so right and there's a pa packet and there's a waiver form and we have all of that okay thank you Councilman Chair. bank when somebody applies at a bank Councilman Adela? well one of the things that Councilman Constant just mentioned and I don't know I'm not, I'm not an attorney but obviously we'd have to look into the legal lead. she said check a credit check I don't know if that can be done. So that's something, if you don't mind, director, if you could look into it. So I will. Legal. So we have done it for certain people that are a in credit position. report check. Yeah, if okay. there's people that are holding money, and it depends what position Well, I think it's a good idea. You want to make sure it's they legal. Have to consent right. to it is all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. I guess we'll move on. Uh, well, I was just going to say, oh, in addition to the newspaper, I know we, it was mentioned by Lynn in regards to the newspaper, but obviously, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to take it upon the administration to put, put stuff on social media about this present, you know, potential job position yeah. in addition yeah. to the newspaper. <laughs> Professionally, we should just be. We definitely want to put it on our website and in the paper. Right. 
Is that in the chart? Social media, you might end up with a debate. <laughs> well, I, I'm just saying, I'm, I'm talking about like the from the city hall. Putting oh, out city something hall. Job yeah, opening. I think at city hall. Yeah, no, not from not from us. Yeah, you. She does. She said yeah, she's yeah. going to do that anyways. Okay, is there any public comment on this? Just what you should do. Come to the podium, state your name, and you have three minutes. Uh, Ned up again, Rosetta Street. Uh, I came here today to pay taxes. I, I wasn't prepared with your subject matter, just on what I learned. This is what I think. I think you need to sit down for this temporary position for only six months. And it's going to be very hard because nobody with the kind of experience that was outlined here is leaving his job to do a job for six months. So you're going to have to find a retired person that you probably easily can. But the hooker in this question is the election. Any fool can run for treasurer. You can't stop him based on your idea of qualifications. Nobody mentioned that. There are factions in this city. One faction or another is going to present their person who may not qualify at all, but they have the political power to be elected. However, the solution is this. You need to change the charter so that you have an appointed account, uh, controller, then you're going to, if you could do that quickly and within that six months of that appointment, then you could advertise and people with similar positions will be applying for the job. That is the only sensible thing to do. This city got lucky 20 years ago by getting him who was qualified. So hey. deal with only what you could control, change that charter, make sure you get a controller and the first suggestion you better find some retired people that have that expertise okay. i certainly do not thank you <laughs> any other public comment let's move on um, next on the study session is ordinance h-19-06 is jeff clark here he is please come to the podium Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm here, I'm not sure why, other than to talk about this ordinance. So Walter invited me to uh, come and perhaps answer some questions that you may have. Well, I guess at this point in time, the um, clerk's office is not sure how to move forward in reissuing licenses to hookah lounges that are already licensed and they need guidance i mean is there something we can do to make it easier on them i think that that's one issue uh walt seemed to suggest another issue is on on new applications uh, once you reach the limit of seven yeah, okay. well, we already, it's supposed to come to city council once you reach the seven. And you had one of those, apparently. Yes. And no action was taken. Correct. Okay. Um, and he, he asked me my opinion on that. So um, on that issue, uh, it certainly is my opinion that if an applicant comes before the council, you need to take action one way or another. Um, if, if he were to go to court or she would go to court, I think it would be pretty clear for the judge to tell this council that you need to you need to act on an applicant. You can't just can't just accept. council chair. Excuse me, Councilman Muscat. I don't remember the applicant coming before council and asking. Does anybody remember? No. Nope. No. Nope. So I, I wasn't here. One of one of I'm sorry, council chair. Councilman Abella. So one of the challenges in that particular case is the applicant went to uh, the clerk's office mm -hmm. and then it was presented by the clerk's office to us. Okay. Which is opposite of what the ordinance said, which is that they have to go through the. But I. But a part of the reason maybe is probably because there's still a lot of confusion on this, but this ordinance was the way it was written was they'd have to come before the council. Apl not apply, but ask 
to have one more permit, sure. in this case, eight or nine or whatever it is. And then they would go into the clerk's office and fill out the applications, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that was probably one of the reasons why it was not voted on in that particular day, because it did not follow the procedures of the ordinance that's okay. in place. All right, was the applicant here? Nope. No. no, no, his attorney was. Okay. But they never applied for anything. They just, they just showed up here and threatened. So, I mean, if the applicant came before us, I mean, this is what I've been thinking all along. Uh, I mean, the, they're, they're given something in the ordinance. They were given the ordinance, I'm sure. And it states right in it, all they have to do is come, the applicant needs to come forward. And nobody's come forward. Well, they did, but through the clerk's office. And then yeah, well, clerk again, it didn't come it. before the, 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 council. the city council. Right. And it says that you got to come before the city council. Right. Was, okay. was his or her attorney here? Yes. yes, just the attorney, but they Two never, two. but they never, apply, never know. formally requested yeah. this, the, the no. council to no. no to grant another one. The okay. attorney spoke during the the speeches on agenda items only in the beginning, and I think it was two minutes, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. is what they're allowed. So he did speak in, in in that regard, but when it came up on the agenda, it failed it, for it lack failed. of because nobody presented it for the correct applicant. Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't seconded. No. It, was, it wasn't I supported at all. There was no motion. There was no motion at all. No. Okay. So on that issue, I would I would simply say, if somebody comes, either a proposed applicant or his or her attorney, the council needs to act on it. Madam Chair. Councilman Constan. So in other words, is we have it on the agenda. Someone needs to make the motion, second, and say we deny the application because we already have seven. Uh, hookah lounges that are licensed and this would violate the moratorium or uh, you know something along those lines as opposed to just saying or dies for lack of support yeah I think you would want to have articulated the reasons why you are not going to allow another one um, if you weren't to do that and I think your city attorney would 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 certainly support this if you don't articulate the reason there's nothing for a court to review so we say, for example, we've, we've already found that the uh, hookah lounges and other cities and this operator has caused problems, and because of that, A, B, and C, and blah, 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 we deny, and then there's some factual basis to, for it to hold up in court. Absolutely. Those A, B, and Cs are, are important things to have. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Also, like I said, I know that the clerk's office does need some guidance on how to reissue or renew licenses for already existing hookah lounges, and that's a big issue right now with them. They're they're just scrambling. Okay, I can certainly work with uh, with Walt on that. Um, okay. Um, I don't think that that's a huge issue. Um, they go through, I would suspect, a similar process. Uh, I didn't write the ordinance. I don't have it memorized. I think they have a year to to get reissued. Right. Once you are issued one. You keep right. it for a year. Mm -hmm. Right. Every year they renew it, and right now we're at the point everybody's ready to renew and nobody's sure what to do, right? Oh, yeah, oh, that's I know there was confusion as far as the fees, if you remember, remember at the last... I think we decided on no fees because yeah. it was going to cause okay. a nightmare for the clerk's office. Yeah, no One dollar, right? I think you did the resolution. Yes. Yeah. The application fee shall be set at one dollar, which you may from time to time adjust. Yes. Right. Okay. <laughs> And Madam Chair, Councilman Constant. I think we need to agree, and but we can have the clerk or, or not agree call you and say because Gary, for whatever reason, uh, he didn't write the ordinance. He has uh, maybe some feelings about it, so the clerk can call you and say, uh, and that's a council decision, uh, and, and get some guidance. I have been talking to Walt um, for the last few weeks, so okay. we're talking he seems about, to be busy on other matters for some reason. Uh, I, I guess he was saying about calling Gary, Gary Miyaki. I'm sorry? You were talking about calling Gary Miyaki. In right? other words, call you instead of Gary. Well, he put himself in conflict of interest, uh, Mr. Yeah. Miyaki, so uh, he can't represent So Walt, him. instead of talking to Gary, he talks strictly just Yeah, to I think that's what he's been doing. Too. Okay. I think he's been talking to him. Okay, I have um, our secretary, Lynn. Uh, Walt gave me this, and I don't know if this is for counsel or if it's for Mr. Clark, but it's. he said take it in case you need it oh. and it is the following is your 2019 tobacco specialty real store exemption renewal affidavit does it sound familiar uh, 
But again, I'd have to read it. I don't know what's in it. Okay. Yes. Madam Chair. I'll follow up with Walt. Okay, okay thank that you. That was a big thank issue you. was the application and what was in it and if it was finalized and. Okay. Madam Chair, okay. before you leave, there was one other thing that Walt brought up that night. Uh, okay. If somebody forgives their, or for, forfeits their license, what's the process for them? How do you go to the next person? What's that? Okay. Right, we have one um, owner that is going to be selling so that the new owner would have to apply for a new license. Does it transfer from the old owner? Is it no. grandfathered in or they have to come back before us too? A new licensee would have to come before council. Okay. Uh, to get the approval. Regardless if they bought, uh, bought because the, I know they can buy licenses, they're transferable. Yeah. And in, so in your order and still specifically with the existing licensee, the person or the corporation, if the corporation remains the same and it's just being owned by somebody different as a part of the sale, I would think at that point the license stays where it is and he would not have to apply again. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I, Thank you. I think that covered it all. I mean, our ordinance, I thought, covered it all when the applicant needed to come forward and give us his spiel on why he wants the license. I mean, and that never really happened. Mm -hmm. the application. Madam Chair. Councilman was, Constant. Was the is the application done so we, he has the form, the clerk in hand to say this is the application? Is it, do you know? I, 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 or think, I think we looked at the form the last time we were here, yeah. But he never brought it forward to us. Well, the applicant never time. did. Okay, hey, Councilman Wenzel. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we allow seven. Now, if somebody uh, either wants to sell theirs or the year's up and they don't, they don't desire to renew it, do we have the ability to say, okay, we're just going to go with six? And then, uh, you know, or do we have to go back to seven? Is it is it a, a reliable or legally responsible to go back up to seven? Yeah, I don't think there's anything in the ordinance that requires you to have seven. I, th I think it said up, up to, to seven. seven. Up to seven. So we can so actually. Anybody else? We can change that at any time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right, thanks. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I just have um, one more thing, if, I, if you don't mind, about the attorneys still there. Okay, because I was going to have you public comment if you want, and I'm going to ask you to stay. Well, he, but he's asking it, just a question. Okay. okay, go ahead. Yeah, it's just, from what I recall, and Lynn, you might <coughs> correct me if I'm wrong. I want to ask a question. It too. was brought forward yes. to you by the applicant, but a motion wasn't made by anybody to, and then so it died at that level. When, when, when was the applicant here? Yeah. Wasn't it on the agenda, Lynn? No. The, the, Council, the, Chair. Um, Council Chair? Yes. No, the applicant was not here, but no. it was on the agenda. It was presented by the clerk. Yeah. Um, smoking application and everything that's required. Yeah, but that's, like that was the clerk, seven. but the applicant, the ordinance says the applicant has to be here. Yeah. So you want me to tell Walt that the applicant. Yeah, the applicant has, applicant has according to the ordinance, ordinance, the applicant has so, to be here. So when it comes to the agenda, because you know how we prepare the agenda, does. He asked to put the item on the agenda, or does he ask to? We ask, trying to figure. We the put thing. the item on the agenda and ask him to be present if he wants to be considered for it. So the clerk should still bring it forward. He still presents it to the right because he's he's applying in the clerk's office anyway. So, so then at the time when the clerk accepts it, then he has to contact the applicant and say, can you come to this meeting? Councilman Bazzi, did you have something to say? I, I, I want to, you know, relate. It, it's still the ordinance says before you even, the place is open. Okay, before that even happens, he's supposed to go in front of the council, get approval before you even put the application through the system. So everything is being done backwards here. Okay, so you're saying that. Yeah, he's already operating I mean, I without a license yeah. and he just, to me, Every, he just didn't yeah. care. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so what you're so they violated the moratorium, they violated the uh, ordinance. Out. Period. Okay, I think, I think that was pretty simple uh, with how the ordinance was written. That the applicant had to been here. Uh, I would say the applicant or his or her attorney. It well, yeah, or his representatives, it, it but I, I mean, they. Well, the person has to be no, whoever's on the application. Said the the person. person, yeah, the person well, on the application. I mean, legally, it would it could either be him or his attorneys, correct? I, 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 I would think a court would say that that would that would. Not be the way we wrote the it, though. But I think, like he's the attorneys telling us in a court of law, his attorneys could 
be with him. I, I mean, I want to do this as right as possible. I mean, they could uh, be with him, but he would have to. Be well, I, if if I was the if I was the applicant, I'd want to be here too. I mean, that just only makes sense that they can, he yeah, would they be can here for themselves, uh, put his best foot forward. But uh, uh, that's the that's the out that's been in that ordinance since it was written. Madam Chair. Councilman Constant? Yeah, and we had not only the applicant for, or we had, there were two attorneys as Last firm, week. they were both here, but then an attorney for one of the existing operators. One of the existing Hukalo Lounge operators was also here. Okay, any further comment so, from Council? Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I will open it up to public comment. No public comment? I think she has something for This lady um, wants to talk. Mr. Mr. Clark? Mr. She wants to talk to you, that lady. What? On the side. Outside? Um, Outside. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, at this point in time, is there any public comment? Um, all right, that ends our study session. Have a good night.